Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world. We're so excited to have you. My name is Jamie Rock. I'm the program manager in our continuing and professional education center here at the Open Campus. And I bring you warm greetings on behalf of our director, um, Dr. Sarah Owen and our team. And just so that we don't delay our webinar because we have a very short time period today, I'm gonna to jump right in and introduce our panelists for this afternoon. Joining us is Dr. Rochelle Hain. She's a published author, global speaker, management consultant, and senior lecturer. She holds a PhD in international human resource management, and she's the founder and CEO of Crowd Potential Consulting Inc. Her passion lies in applying good people management practices within the growing digital economy and she's traveled across Southeast Asia to explore the world's top remote working hotspots, specifically Thailand and Indonesia, to explore co-working spaces and interview globally dispersed workers. She specializes in gig HR, which is a term she actually coined to describe the discipline of using HRM to help companies enhance their working relationships with contract or gig workers, uh, digital nomads and other offsite stakeholders. So welcome, Rochelle. Thank you for being here with us this afternoon. Thank you for having me. And then our next panelist is Mr. Christopher Lee, who is a speaker, trainer, tourism development and hospitality professional with over 10 years of experience in the industry. He's a PRO for the Chinese Association of Barbados, and he spent most of his formative years working with the international Hilton hotel chain, completing a number of stints across North America and the Caribbean. Uh, he recently spent a couple of years in Beijing, China, where he did a master's degree in tourism management and where he also gained a ton of really valuable work experience in local training and the tourism planning industry in China. He spent a number of time working in tourism and development related initiatives that specifically focus on the Sino-Caribbean relationship. So that's going to speak to how um, that cross-cultural exchange works in the digital nomad space. And so within that space, he's done international business and tourism uh, training. And he's focused specifically on promoting research efforts on cross-cultural communication and engagement. So welcome, Chris. Thank you for joining us as well and, and providing your expertise to this really interesting uh, webinar topic of digital nomadism, digital sure. nomadism the new normal. Uh, thank you, Chris. No, thank you, Jamie. I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. So I'll just, without further ado, pass over to our panelists for this afternoon. Fantastic. Thank you, Jamie. So we're going to go ahead and start by sharing the slide. But of course, want to first let me start off by thanking the UE Open Campus for this great collaboration and the team there who have thus far done such a great job. We are looking forward to providing you a very informative and dynamic session, albeit short, but just whet that appetite because this is such an interesting time that we're going into now. So as Jamie would have highlighted, we're looking at the concept of digital nomadism as the concept of it being a new normal. And we focus on three main topics. First is answering the what. So what are these different forces driving the new ways of working? What is digital nomadism? And how does that also differentiate from another coin topic such as remote working? Then we move into the why. Why is this important for us in the Caribbean and by extension, the global workforce? And furthermore, what are the different pros and cons? Because again, we know that while there are a lot of advantages to working within the digital space and looking at digital communication, that there are things that we need to be mindful of when we're moving into and trying to engage in that space. And lastly, because we really want you to walk away with some key tips and tools, we're going to give you some, a few how, how to build this career online how to become a digital nomad or how to better maximize this whole concept and lifestyle of remote working. So with that being said, we're gonna have Rochelle starting off now into giving you the context of digital nomadism and these different driving forces. Rochelle? Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you everyone for having us. We are really excited to be here and we are really excited by this partnership um, with the UE Open Campus on this very relevant topic. And what I would say about this is that this is not something that has been caused by the pandemic, but this is something that has been accelerated by the pandemic. So I've been describing it, let's say, um, as a silent revolution over the last two years that's really been, uh, that's really come to the core. My research um, on this project was over two years, so that's why I say two years, but this has been creeping up for quite a while. 
um, this change in the way that we work. And that's been caused by several things. Um, so I've just, with regards to the new normal, I've put together five key points that really influences the context that we see now. Uh, so first, with regards to increasing remote work and keep more people working online and seeking careers online, that's been uh, facilitated by increased digital adoption due to technological developments. So a lot of communication mechanisms that weren't available um, when we think of management and the way that we work traditionally over the past um, few decades. But with those sort of technological developments, it, it's opened a lot of work opportunities and it's really challenged the way that we think about work in the current context. And then you also have the gig economy that's led on from those technological developments. The fact that you now have these business firms that exist purely online, where persons can become employed by these organizations and never have any sort of physical contact with them, but they can acquire clients through these, let's say, intermediary sites. So the gig economy um, has really led to more persons, let's say, gigging or taking up freelance jobs via online portals and online platforms. And we've seen that with Uber, companies like Uber or Deliveroo, where you book a taxi through an app and then you don't have any contact itself with Uber, the company, but through the app, you're able to meet the taxi driver and so forth. And then all of this, all of this, these, these occurrences have really been sped up now and accelerated because of the current pandemic that we're going through. We're now in a situation where we're asked to socially distance, we're asked to stay away from people. And with that in mind and trying to keep safe, a lot of organizations for their own survival have turned to remote working. And so it's really COVID-19 that has taken this silent revolution and brought it right in our faces. And in particular in the Caribbean where we're so dependent on tourism and we're so dependent on visitors um, and that sort of, let's say, income, where we're now finding ourselves in a position where we don't have many tourists, where a lot of people have lost their jobs as a result, uh, the digital economy and digital nomadism becomes, uh, well, a, a, very good, a very good option because now you have a lot more opportunities to gain work further, further afield than, let's say, the Caribbean. And as a result of this, we're seeing really an organizational shift and a cultural shift. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. But management have really been forced to rethink the way they think about work and how employees work as a result of these sort of changes, which has also led us to consider the cross-cultural element with regards to broadening that diversity lens. Because whereas you would have been working with someone previously within your immediate physical location, now you're working in teams with people from across the globe. And for some people, this would have been um, normal already, but within the Caribbean context, um, how we traditionally think of work and the work that we traditionally know has been nine to five. So I'm gonna hand over to Chris, who's gonna tell us a bit more again about that cultural shift and really the impact of that cross-cultural, um, let's say that widening cross-cultural mix. Right. So as Rochelle would have said before, this situation is not, it's not really new. It's something that has existed, but has really been accelerated due to COVID and due to a lot of the, the new way of remote, increased way of remote working and digital adoption. But what is interesting about this is that traditionally these types of con, uh, concepts when it comes to cross-cultural engagement and uh, multicultural workforces would have typically been considered something to look at from the large conglomerate perspective. So people that have many companies that have many different branches or uh, divisions all over the world, but this has now become something increasingly applicable to even the small micro and multinational um, organizations and even the independent consultants. With regards to tourism, as this is my field, we look at it from the perspective of not only tourism not being something, something that has re had a severe impact, but then we have to pivot to other new industries and then looking for work outside of our physical geographic boundaries. And those in opportunities really uh, are limitless. And so it's important for us to understand not only what is it about and where do we find these types of opportunities, but more importantly, how do we really engage with people and communities from all around the globe. And so that's why it's so important that as Rosha would have said, the emphasis is on that broadening of our diversity, broadening of our concepts of not just working within our one from a time frame nine to five, but more importantly, just within that geographical constraint. 
So of course, many of you might try to understand what are the main characteristics of these persons or communities such as digital nomads. So Rochelle's gonna go ahead and explain that particular aspect of what do what are these parts entailed within digital nomadism? Yeah. So thank you so much, Chris. And this word digital nomadism is it's right in our face right now. We're hearing it all of the time because of the pandemic, but it has been a term that's been trending probably for the last, well, I'll say for the last five, six years, we've been hearing about digital nomadism more and more. So what we really mean by digital nomadism is where you are location independent. You are working in a way that takes you from place to, you're place, to place. You're not necessarily tied to one location. So that can take many forms. You can be an individual who's working for one company, but as you work for this one company online, you are working from across different countries, or you can be working from across different cafes. So it can be in one country, but you're just moving around different locations. Um, so that's what we really mean. You're not tied to the location that the company is in. And then you also have your freelancers, so who are working and traveling and exploring, um, but they're working primarily for a number of clients at a time. So not just one company, but they take the jobs as, as they come in. So that's what really the typical digital nomad life looks like. Again, it doesn't have to be country hopping. It can just mean that you're working from location to location, even if that is uh, within the same parish even. So right. And I think you make a really good point there, Rochelle. So sorry to interject. So, you know, many of you might be thinking, okay, well, digital nomadism or a nomadic lifestyle, that's not necessarily something that is my reality now or something I want to adopt. But that's why it's important to have that differentiation between that and remote working, because there's still a lot of these similar characteristics where you might be desirous of adopting, such as the flexible work schedule, the change in environment. So as Rochelle said, maybe not necessarily hopping from country to country, but it's simply cafe to cafe or having that flexibility to say, OK, well, today I'd like to operate from home and then I can go into the office for a few hours. So it's a really new, different way of thinking. And in broadening that way, it helps us to realize that there are more than there are more than one option and ways of working. Sorry. Yeah. So just adding to what Chris has said, digital nomadism is a type of remote working. So yeah. it's not that you need to qualify as a digital nomad by traveling from country to country and so forth but it's more just a form of remote working. And it's a form that really mixes or blurs the line between work and leisure. And as Chris mentioned with regards to the, the nine to five, it's really challenging that nine to five work process. So you often find a lot of digital nomads have, a, I, I've, I'll give you an example of my research. I met a lot of digital nomads in Thailand who have said they left the corporate world because they were tired of being in an office they felt like it was stunting their creativity. They hated the commuting, all of this. They just wanted to live and enjoy life while working. Um, so this was their real impetus to, to push back against traditional forms of work. And you will find in more and more of that, well, what really brought it to the fore when this was a silent revolution at the time was um, the younger generation, Generation Y and Generation Z, um, really challenging old mindsets, rebelling against the nine to five, but also rebelling against how they work. So rather than being told by their managers how to perform a particular task, they want to not only complete their tasks well, but they want to define their own parameters and the way in which that task should be completed. So these sort of changing and challenging mindsets around work has really led to this increasing, prefer increasing preference for digital nomadism. And then enter COVID-19, and it's really now where you're, where you're having people who've become unemployed and now have to look or to create, in some cases, new jobs. A lot of people are turning towards the digital economy to do this. So I'm just going to say a little bit more about the digital economy itself and some of the benefits of, of working online. Now, one of the things that we've said is that it provides individuals with a, far, a, a further reach, so more employment opportunities outside of your globe, outside of your local environment. And this has become sometimes, uh, in, in some cases right now, it's become the lifeline for a lot of individuals who've been permanently laid off or whose companies have gone under. I know companies that have shifted completely online because that's the only way they can survive. Unfortunately, they've had to let go of their employees and now they've gone purely online and they're trying to extend um, globally in order for their own survival. So it does, in, in a time of a pandemic and times of crisis, it does present more employment opportunities. 
Um, for a lot of companies, you have now the ability to access the best in global talent and to partner with people from across the globe that previously you might not have considered. So one of the things I've said to companies is um, when, because a lot of companies, particularly in the UK, have said that there is a shortage of talent. And often when I hear that, I said, I often think to myself, is it that there's a shortage of talent or is it that you're only looking in one place for your talent? Maybe you need to widen your talent lens. So the digital economy allows us to do that. Also, again, that increased flexibility. So moving away from the nine to five and being able to work in a way that best suits you, especially if you have particular responsibilities or you want to carve out a certain, a certain lifestyle. And then finally, also that global customer base, you can now market yourself and market your product right across the globe, as opposed to, let's say within just the Caribbean region. But with that comes a lot of challenges as well. One of, one of the challenges that a lot of companies find and workers as well is the visibility challenge, or that's what I like to call it at least. So for a lot of companies, especially, I always say, especially in the Caribbean, we have such a tradition of the nine to five uh, employment, uh, let's say, what do I call it? Let's say the nine to five employment model, let's call it a model. We have such a tradition of that. And with that is linked this idea of if we can't see workers, how do we know that they're actually working? So this is something that causes managers a lot of um, contention, especially when the lockdown first started. Uh, a lot of managers were worried about, well, how can they trust their employees to work if they can't see them? Um, on the other side, with workers, there is sometimes that missing link or that missing feeling of not being included in the environment, in the office environment. You might miss those water cooler or photocopy and talks. So that lack of social atmosphere and visibility can also be a problem sometimes, especially if you live on your own. Some, some people come to work for that experience alone. So another challenge is really the work-life balance. And this needs not much elaboration at all, for especially for those of you who have been in a situation where you are now taking care of your, or during the lockdown, you were taking care of your kids while working. Um, I think the picture depicts it quite perfectly, although he doesn't look as stressed as some people that I've spoken to. Um, so that's, that's a part of it. And then also there's this issue of higher expectation. Often because people, let's say if you're a freelancer and you're not a part of the company and the company knows very little about you, um, they haven't used you before and they don't have that direct link to you. Because of that lack of oversight, sometimes companies expect a higher quality of delivery. Often the issue with that though is that they don't provide the same amount of resources that they would provide to their in-house employees. So sometimes the, the higher level of expectation without the necessary support and communication can be a real problem within the digital economy. And finally, on top of um, and these are just a few challenges and benefits, but these are some of the key ones that pop up. There is also an issue within the digital nomad culture of loneliness. It can be a very lonely lifestyle. If you're constantly working on your own, if you're working from one location, let's say a cafe, or if you're working, if you're going from country to country, sometimes it can be very hard to form relationships. So there are benefits, but there are also challenges associated. And I'll hand over to Chris just to say a little bit more before we move on. Now, what's really beautiful, I mean, we're going to move on to the next one. What, what's really beautiful is that while ha they have these benefits, there are certain things, again, you need to be mindful of when it comes to looking at global talent or a global customer base, because we know that those expectations change a lot of times from market to market. Also, the expectations of work culture changes from country to country. And so these are the things that we need to be educate ourselves on and be mindful of, especially when it comes to that communication. Now, formerly, what would have been really good what would have been a previous challenge with regards to offline communication is that you have things such as the language barrier. So people not speaking the same language and not getting the same point across. And so that would cost you a lot of time and productivity. And then leaning that into the different experiences, standards, values, and behaviors, because again, the way that we are socialized from culture to culture or just different communities vary. And so when we're looking to go and move into an increasingly multicultural space, it's really important for us, especially from top down and bottom up, uh, to, to really educate ourselves, sensitize and understand, well, what are those differences and what are those similarities and how can we connect and build those relationships off of the similarities, but also use the differences to then 
in addition and um, increasingly also help strengthen that relationship. And then on, on top of that, in educating ourselves, we are really looking at moving away from some of that stereotypical thinking. So in one particular case, one people might think that when you're dealing with, in my situation, dealing in China, the general expectation was that it's called a 996 culture. So Chinese people will work 24 hours, get the job done in, in very, as soon as possible. Whereas somebody might just anticipate that, oh, but if I'm dealing with the Caribbean, that generally most Caribbean people want to take a more laid back approach, maybe not on weekends, but that's, as we all know, that's not always the case. And so it's important that we don't adopt and adhere just to those stereotypical thinking, even if that might be the circumstance. It's about trying to look at it and say, okay, what is the exact situation with the talent pool based on my previous knowledge? And then going into it, making your own on-site evaluation when you're going to work with that particular colleague or company. Fortunately, though, with the digital economy and through digital education, um, sorry, communication, we do have a lot of different language tools and we have the access to the internet, which will help us with that education and sensitization. And overall, it really helps us to simplify this communication process. So again, there are a lot of different things that we can gain from it. But of course, it's really important for us to go into it with this type of awareness and knowledge and look at how to best prepare ourselves to adopt this new norm or new way of working. So what we'll do next is, sorry, go ahead, Rochelle, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I'll just add to what Chris has said really quickly. One of the things that um, is really good to emphasize here as well is that the digital economy, while it provides advantages when trying to navigate cross-cultural spaces in that you have language translation tools and, and you can look up on the internet and get um, information about certain cultural interactions. It doesn't remove these barriers. In some cases, it helps to reduce them, but a lot of these barriers are also still around mindset and digital tools alone can't solve those. So it's really important in this current culture to develop those that shift in mindset and to understand the shift that is needed. Which is, which is partly why these types of platforms and trainings and discussions are so important. So you're completely correct, Rochelle. I think that we, we can't just lean on any one tool or platform to make, create that solution. It's a combination. And at the end of the day, even though we are increasingly moving into digital space, there still is a need and a purpose for offline interactions and offline communication. Yes which I know we are all dying for during a pandemic. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> yes. Okay, so we've just included, because our time is very limited, but we just included um, some key steps to becoming a digital nomad, if this is a path that you're really considering. And I like um, the last comment Chris made with regards to the, um, the different skills that you can be developing on and offline, because it's, it's really a mixture of, of different competencies that you, you'll need. So the first step we have here is to do a skills audit. And that, what we mean by that is to examine the current skills. If you're looking to build a career online or to have this uh, digital nomad life, the first thing is to understand what you are capable of offering. So do a skills audit in that it's, it's a way of examining what you've done already, what you like to do and what experiences you have or are passionate about or particularly talented in and see in, in looking at that amalgamation or combination of things, look at what it is you think you have to offer. Or in some cases, you may you might need to get help in, the, in understanding what is your niche that you can present. And then also key, especially in the digital world, is building your competencies. And there are so many ways of doing that online now. There are so many courses um, that are offered, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and they're just different ways in which you, when you're working online, that you can seek to develop yourself. But one of the things that are re that's really going to be important is to have that continual, continuous learning mindset if you're working in a digital economy. And while the hard skills, as Chris mentioned, and we mentioned before, with let's say, for example, communication tools and so are important, the softer skills, particularly a cross-cultural mindset, which is our next point, is really crucial knowing how to build relationships, knowing how to be sensitive, emotional intelligence and so forth are key skills as well that need to be developed if you're working within the digital space, but offer also across the globe. Mm -hmm. Then also be familiar, that's the fourth point I have here, be familiar with the different online and hosting platforms that you're trying to use, rather than trying to sign up to every platform and hoping to get a job. 
perhaps see which platform is suitable for what you were trying to offer and then see how you can tailor what you are offering and how you can present your profile online so that can be useful to you and valuable rather than just being existing on platforms and not getting anything out of them. I think what you're with um, with Rochelle saying that, especially putting the first two points there, it's it's a very strategic effort. It's very intentional. So when you do that audit, when you do that continuous evaluation, it helps you to create that sense of direction of where do you where do you think your unique selling point is and where where can you find people that market that will match with what you have to offer? And yeah. so because we know that in a digital space, there's so much information, there's so many groups, there's so many different outlets, and it can become very overwhelming. But it's so important to have that sense of an awareness of yourself and what you have to bring to the table. So then you can kind of filter that. Because if not, you can, as Rochelle said, essentially find yourself just waving around, going from place to place and, and not effectively, effectively finding the right jobs that will, will lead to maybe something that will make you happy or take advantage of the skill sets that you have to offer, which yeah. is why when you're, sorry, go ahead, Rochelle. Oh, no, I was, I was just agreeing with you. And I yeah. was saying, <laughs> I was saying that's really important rather than just flailing on the internet being Just another casting a huge net right which is why when you're then that all then plays into that part which goes into the next point which is talking about building that online brand and online presence because what whereby previously maybe in this social media space a lot of people would have used it to showcase their social endeavors oh here am i at a party or here am i at this hike which are great but when it comes to business you really have to have the wider uh digital world know well what are you known for what are the key projects that you're working on what are the types of initiatives papers and things that you're writing because that's the type of information that will help you translate going from just something you use for personal purposes and then moving it into a professional uh, professional uh, environment. And yeah. then lastly, you really need to look at networking again, being strategic, being very uh, specific. And while again, it's not, when we say network, 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 yes, it's about building relationships, but um, as, you'll, as we'll talk about a little bit, it's talking about building meaningful collaborations, building meaningful and sustainable rela working relationships, which is very different to just, again, befriending anybody on this, the digital space. Yeah, so you would have, um, you, I don't know if you're, well, you're probably, most people are familiar with LinkedIn. And one of the things that you probably see a lot on LinkedIn is you get people that add you randomly and then they're on your profile, you never have any contact with them. Um, and then they just exist there. And you might do the same thing as well to build your numbers. But it's really, if you want to be effective in the digital space, it's really about thinking about strategic collaborations, which collaborations are you actually hoping to build relationships out of? rather than just adding numbers that, that do nothing for you. So just to reiterate that point about online brand one, knowing how to present yourself online, but, and then two, the, the last point there, knowing exactly how to build the right relationships if you really want to be successful in that sort of digital nomad path. Now, of course, you know that time is limited and we really want to give our audience, our viewers, a chance to ask some questions, really get some answers that might be burning on their mind. But we do want to take an opportunity to let you know that we did not, we're not leaving you hanging, that in partnership with UU Open Campus, we are developing a workshop that has four interactive online modules. So as you can see here, they're entitled, which first finding that niche in the digital world, which really stems back to what we were using in our different points, developing that global cross-cultural mindset, then creating those meaningful collaborations, and then finally building that online brand. Yes, so these modules really are a deep dive into a lot of the points that we mentioned previously, um, especially, and they're particularly important. We have them in, a partic in that particular order uh, quite purposefully. Um, just really identifying first what it is that you have to offer and then knowing how to interact with people online, knowing how to, to, to create sustainable relationships and also knowing how to be consistent in your brand and what you're offering. Perfect. So if you, want to be, if you want to build a successful career online, these are the steps and these are the, the intricate points that really help in, in that process. Right. So, so yes. of course, if you're interested, yes, make sure we have our contact information here. Please feel free to 
uh, reach out to us, whether via email, LinkedIn, Instagram, and so forth, as well as stay tuned with UE Open Campus, because again, this is a partnership that we are looking to bring to you in the near future. Uh, but with that being said, if, uh, if any of our viewers outside do have any questions, we are excited and ready to answer that for you. And I'm gonna just turn over to Jamie, our lovely moderator of the afternoon uh, to help to facilitate that. Thank you so much. And it's been such an exciting and informative conversation. I was listening with bated breath because the information is so viable and so relevant for the times that we're in. And so I'm just going to jump into some of the questions that we got in the chat. So the first one asks, um, how does one find jobs and companies where you can be a digital nomad or are there tips for job seeking if you're looking to work as a digital nomad but with an existing company so the first thing i would do is to, if you are currently working already i would speak to your boss speak to your manager especially this is the time where areas are open and people are more malleable let's put it that way <laughs> um, so find out now that a lot of people are more open to remote working and they realize that this can work find out what opportunities might already exist where you are or where there's that opportunity to convert your role into um, a remote working role if it is that you're seeking to work online um, there are a lot of platforms it depends on where you're working there are a lot of job seeking platforms that are now advertising remote working positions so it might be just a case of scanning the internet and seeing what's out there. I know there's um, Caribbean jobs. So it's typically sites that you would normally use. Uh, Caribbean jobs in, in the UK is indeed.co.uk. You also have read. So there are a lot of different profiles. Caribbean can be very useful as well. So there are a lot of existing recruitment or HR firms or platforms that are advertising remote work. But then there are also, let's say the more generic online site so if you put in remote working opportunities that could be a good start but also you can check out gig platforms as well so for example there's people per hour there's um what is the other one that's very popular upwork um that's u-p-r-o-r-o-k right <laughs> u-p-w-o-r-k <laughs> sorry yes so there are quite a few platforms a really good one especially if you're an hr and management professional is one circle so, right. so a lot of really a work time go is another good one. So there, there are more and more of these platforms popping up and they might and be I, a good place to start. And I just want to emphasize again, maybe it is that you, because, because of the, with COVID, the pandemic happening right now, you might not be looking to jump to another country or so forth and do that nomadic lifestyle. But as Rochelle says, in your own company, you might be surprised that they have different positions that are open in those different countries, but they're allowing you to remote work for a certain period of time. And then hopefully as things resume back to normal, you will then, if, if you do the job well, or if you tend to, if you think it's something that you like, then they might then be able to relocate you. So again, there's a lot of different kind of arrangements that can come about, but I definitely have to emphasize what Rochelle says, start where, where you are at. See what's happening in your own company because it's not that we're necessarily wanting you to just jump ship and just go again just sporadically everywhere you, it really still has to be in alignment with is this is this where you want to go and is this in alignment with what your different skill sets can best offer and provide within this space and what your needs are as well and what your needs are correct great sounds good so i have two questions that are a bit similar so one one was a comment and one is a question so the question is what do you think is needed to get away from the mentality of work being only physical behind a desk? And then someone had commented saying that the work culture in the Caribbean is very, um, it suffers from the legacy of the plantation, um, where there's the assumption that productivity requires rigid oversight. So I think those are very, are coupled. So if you could speak yeah. to that. Absolutely. That's, that legacy is, is the reason that we have the organizational culture that we have in the Caribbean context. Because let's say after we would have gained independence, after um, a lot of, let's say a lot of laws were implemented to dismantle, let's start with, with slavery. A lot of laws were meant to, were, or a lot of acts were in place to dismantle slavery. But while that occurred theoretically, a lot of day-to-day um, -day practices, let's say within the organizational context, kind of continued or were remodeled and handed right down. So even after independence, the way in which we think of managing is constantly with this 
mentality of we have to see a person and make sure that they're working. And we even see this within HR departments within the Caribbean, where often HR departments tend to be very disciplinary and punitive rather than developmental and focus on career paths and career progression. So it's definitely a link to the history, but it is not something that can't be changed. And I think the more um, we get those voices out there really highlighting the influence or highlighting where that tradition has come from and just really showing that it is not the only option. And I think the pandemic has done that quite well. I'll give you an example, five months, actually in November last year, I presented on this topic. I presented on digital nomadism and remote work at a conference in the Caribbean. And I was told at the time it would never work. I'm out of touch with the Caribbean, yada, yada, yada. Um, enter COVID in March and everyone is remote working. So if just the environment alone has made people rethink a lot of things that they thought were only options. And once people, once things are demonstrated and people see that they can work, um, often they're more willing to change their mind. But and I think so we also need to be a bit realistic also to say yeah. that Again, these that's why these platforms, these workshops, these discussions are so important because cultural shifts are take time. That's just the reality. They will take time. The same with community cultures. All different types of cultures will take time. It will, and it's usually only, as Rochelle said, through adversity that we are forced to because the typical human being type of, um, is resistant a lot of times to change, period. So I think that once we can acknowledge that and recognize that, and then also be very objective as what we've said before. That's why we made sure to tell you the why and looking at the pros and the cons, because it's not always the better roses in the digital economy because they have their, that space has its challenges too. So it's important to go in with understanding both sides of the coin. And then at the end of the day, what we are trying to um, talk about is just looking at it as an alternative as meaning that there's another option. So again, still, paying homage and giving value to that offline interaction, the yeah. fact that people like to be in a physical space sometimes, but also considering that you can do both or Absolutely. one, you know? Yeah. yeah, so just that wider recognition as, as there are alternatives to that nine to five structure and there are alternatives. But mm -hmm. as, as Chris has said, it really does take time to shift your mindset. But experimental experimentation is one way of doing that, just seeing that it can work and hopefully you break it down over time. Yeah, I think a question I would have is, is every job translatable in the digital nomad space? Can every job be, can every career be in, um, incorporated into that kind of option? I'd say that some careers pose more challenges, challenges than others. Um, but with technology, it is amazing what can be done remotely now. Um, there are Often we tell organizations, like when I'm consulting with companies, I tell them, if you want to turn a job into a remote working job, look at the, the job specifications, look at the job requirements, the daily tasks, your customer base, who are you dealing with, and see if that role is really um, feasible to be a remote working role. Maybe it is, but maybe it might be that you do it on a more flexible basis. So some remote working, then some in-house and so forth. So it's really examining the job and, and also examining, examining the context as well. Um, but you've seen, I'll give you an example of a challenging profession. The medical profession can be challenging to be a digital right. hopping from country to country or cafe to cafe. But technology is such now that we're even seeing surgeries being conducted remotely. So where, where we will be in the next um, five years is yeah. um, you'll be amazed what, what technology can accomplish. And I'd like to add to that also, I mean, my field of hospitality. So uh, in one of the really interesting things that has happened, especially if you look back to it with China, so how they dealt with the COVID hotels is that they had robots, AI robots deliver the food to the different person so that there was no interaction. But then the, the other side of that is that people still, when they want, when they travel, when they go to uh, another destination, they want that that physical, that offline cross-cultural interaction with another person. And as much as we can try to do the, the best possible and, and have all the pictures and the videos doing it this way, it doesn't replace somebody physically going to a destination and experiencing that culture that way. So hospitality is definitely another area as well. And then just kind of referring back to what Rochelle said in terms of um, looking at the job descriptions and the job details as to is can it be remote working we also still have to be mindful that there are certain companies and there are still again other cultures around the world that 
they might not be right. Even though this is the way that a lot of people are starting to do it, they might still say, hey, I still kind of really want, I would prefer somebody that can come in a few days a week. So if you're going to apply, you need to be in nearby, even if it's an hour away or so forth. For example, in America, I know for sure that there are lots of people that even though they're adopting digital nomadic lifestyles, that instead of shifting in complete continents, so they're not going to pick up and go to Bali, but they're just going to acquire to remote areas in the US so that if they were to be called on to come to a meeting face to face, they have that um, ability to do so. So again, it's a very mixed bag and a very flexible type of arrangements. But you have to just like so when you're going onto these platforms, just look at the request, the criteria, and the um, what are the different things that are required to adopt and apply for that job. Yeah, and I think oh, go ahead, Rochelle. Oh no, I was just I was just really agreeing with Chris because often what I say to people, because often you get this comment of, okay, does that mean that digital is taking over or the future is robust? But I often say to people that the future of work is still very human. And for example, if you look at meetings like the example that Chris was given, often people say the real meeting occurs after the meeting, after the meeting ends. So those little in-between chats and conversations and so forth, you don't quite get those within the digital space. So it's not to say that the digital will replace the human interaction altogether. There's value in both of them. Yeah, and I was just gonna add that it, it, it requires a level of creativity, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, seeing how, where the gaps are and where you could really um, tweak here and add there. Because when I think about the small business owner, I think they're the most creative of the, in the, in the sphere of, 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 of work, you know, um, Mm -hmm. exchange of products and services are good because they have to figure it out by themselves and they have to do it pretty much from scratch from scratch a lot of times and so it's deciding how not only what works best for you but how that can be sold as 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 working for the for your clients or working for companies that you partner with or, or how we can network especially within the region we already have the tool of csme and Free trade, uh, free trade of goods and services across the region. So looking into current systems that exist and seeing how they can work for your benefit and seeing how that can also translate into having that flexible transition into um, brick and mortar to a digital nomadic lifestyle. And at the end of the day too, just to make that, that comment that companies, whether they be big or small, in, especially in this time, they're just looking for maximum return on their investments and on their resources. So yeah. it comes, a lot of it all in this professional workspace, as fun as it can be, and we, we you know, we, we, it's really about how to manage that, the resources as best as, it can, as they can, and also saving cost. Because <laughs> a, a lot of companies, big and small, have gotten major revenue hits. And as we've seen in the Caribbean and globally, and so that is what they're looking at too. Can this way help me to save my bottom line, you know, and, and, but still be able to be effective and efficient in what I'm trying to offer, whether it be a product or a service. Yeah, yeah for sure. Well, we have no more questions in the chat and we have about a minute left. So we're literally right on schedule, but is there any last words that you'd like to share with our viewers? Um, Rochelle, Chris? I would just say that there are a lot of, opportunities offered in the digital space. It doesn't necessarily mean that it would replace the, the physical interaction. There's value in both, but where we're finding ourselves in a condition where we have to pivot and pivot very quickly in order um, to survive and for our livelihood. Um, yeah. Digital world and digital, and digital nomadism as well, it offers not just employment opportunities for workers, but for organizations, it offers yeah. a way as well to reduce your overhead costs, to, to really think about um, limiting your resources but and in doing this as well there's also an opportunity to increase your productivity so a lot of companies have also reported an increase in productivity when shifting to um, digital work and the remote working space so there is a lot of benefit um, yeah. in going after a digital let's say sort of work approach yeah. and I guess I would probably uh, couple that with just saying as, as we, we've seen in the webinar and in the questions and discussion that this is a very complex multifaceted um, industry but it doesn't have to be overwhelming and so with that being said I just do I want to put in that plug whereby I want our viewers to stay in touch with UE Open Campus and stay tuned for when that workshop does open up because there's so much more information we want to share with you and so many more tips and tools into how to navigate into this seemingly 
um, it's a strange space. It's actually not that bad, but it is new. It is changing and developing, but it is something that we can all take advantage of. And again, it's not a case of trying to substitute one wholly with the other. It's just about considering your alternatives and looking at this very uh, different way of doing things. Yeah, and I, I was going to add that it's also not that strange because I think here at the Open Campus, we are the pioneers in digital nomadism across the region. I don't know a bigger organization that does how much, that does what the Open Campus does. We have uh, colleagues working from the very top of the region in the Bahamas all the way down to, the, to, to Trinidad. So it's so um, exciting what we're doing here at the Open Campus. This has been such a timely and relevant, um, informative session. And I want to thank you both so much, Rochelle. Thank you, Chris, for imparting this knowledge. And we're looking forward to the workshop. And I encourage our, our viewers, like Chris mentioned, to, to watch this space. Uh, we're going to give you more updates on that workshop where you can get practical tools to be able to enter into the, the digital nomadic lifestyle and, and career space. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, Chris. Continue thank you so to be much. safe. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. We both are and continue to be safe to our viewers as well. Have a good evening and um, we'll see you next time. Alrighty. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.